incoming president of the High Tech Business Association, I am pleased to introduce and welcome Qualcomm Executive Chairman Dr. Paul Jacobs to the UCLA Anderson School of Management. UCLA Anderson has become the front runner in preparing MBA students for careers in technology leadership, with almost one third of the, cla of the class of 2014 entering the technology industry. Included in the list of UCLA's top employers are current industry leaders like Amazon, Google, Adobe, Apple, and Qualcomm, with 40 UCLA Anderson alum working for the company in the past five years. Dr. Jacobs is no stranger to Anderson. Just a few months ago, he received the John Wooden Global Leadership Award for a significant business success and upstanding leadership that reflects high benchmarks of performance, integrity, and ethical virtues. Dr. Jacobs is a three-time graduate of University of California at Berkeley with a bachelor's, master's, and doctorate in electrical engineering. He joined Qualcomm as development engineer, then steadily rose in the ranks to vice president, then served as CEO from 2005 until last year. With more than 50 patents granted, his leadership in the field of mobile communications is making a direct impact on the devices we use to connect with others all around the world today. Now, as executive chairman, Dr. Jacobs is focused on developing new technologies and Qualcomm's long-term growth opportunities, like augmented reality startup Magic Leap, where he sits on the board of directors. So please, join me again in welcoming Qualcomm executive chairman, Dr. Paul Jacobs. To elaborate on what Dan said, the John Wooden Award is given to somebody who embodies the principle-based leadership that John Wooden espoused. Many of you know the, the pyramid of all of the wonderful qualities uh, that John Wooden espoused and taught his, his players because he was a teacher. And we're very proud to say that um, Paul was honored because he embodies those. And the drill will be that I'll ask uh, quite a number of questions, in part coming from you, our students and our faculty. And then we'll turn it over to you with the microphones here um, to, to follow uh, your interests. So let's start with the, the John Wooden discussion that we yeah. had when you were here. And you talked about creating a culture of us as opposed to us versus them. Right. That when, when you came in to Qualcomm as the leader, you wanted to change that. So, so talk yeah. about what that meant and how you did it. Well, I, I was running the handset business originally, and I was a brand new manager, and I was trying to create a team sense among that group because we were building a handset business from nothing, going up against a bunch of incumbents, and it was really, really hard. And, you know, it's a cheap leadership trick to use us versus them, and so we would pull ourselves together by talking about how we were so great, but the infrastructure guys, they were wasting the whole company's money and getting us, you know, all this vendor financing, and this was so dangerous, and how, you know, the corporate guys were doing this, and so And so you use that technique, and it does bring people together in a certain way. I mean, you get cohesiveness around your unit, but the problem is that people model what the leader does. I mean, you'd be surprised, you know, I change what I wear, as CEO and all of a sudden everybody else comes in dressed a different way or I change my phone, everybody comes in a different, you know, with a different phone. And so everybody's modeling your behavior and when you're sitting there saying us versus them, then that starts to happen beneath you. And so everybody below you starts saying us versus them. So the engineering guys say, oh, well, the sales guys caused this problem. The marketing people fight with the finance people and it's like this fractal thing. And so I learned that over the course of that business and I took that lesson when I took over Qualcomm and I really thought about what would be an integrative way to pull the company together and really I, I firmly believe in this notion of articulating a vision. I think the leader needs to be able to say here's the mountain we're climbing and here's the next set of mountains that we're going to go climb. Let's all head in this direction and what's nice about that is that when you have very high performing people they all want to do, you know, they, they want to innovate, they, wanna, they don't want to be totally directed all the time. They don't want to be micromanaged. And by articulating a vision allows people to have an idea of what they want to do, and but also shapes it so they're not 
all wandering off in all directions because that's very dangerous too. I mean, if, if you have a big army, you want to march it somewhere. Um, but so that's, what was that vision that created shared purpose across those There divisions? were a number through the history of the company. I mean, the, the first one of the company wasn't actually articulated by my father when he started it, but it was implicit. It was just that digital communications theory was an amazing technology and it was going to change the world. And it was, they didn't actually have products when they started. They just had that idea and then they went out and started to do it. Uh, the next one was they came upon this idea of a certain technology for the cell phone called CDMA. And that one turned into quite the, I don't know, it's like it was really our mission. I mean, everybody, it was almost a holy war. Everybody was like our technology versus these other technologies. Um, and then I started putting, I, I was running the speech compression algorithm group. And so for me, the system was, uh, it was a pipe. And I was building the application at the time. The, the you know, speech was the application. But then we quickly put data on it. And so the next vision that I really pushed hard in the company was this idea that the wireless internet would become a bigger impact on the world than the wired internet, and which has now basically come to pass. And then as we were doing that, and around the point of the, the, the transition uh, from my father to me, we really started to focus in on the vision that the phone was going to be kind of your central point for not just communication, but for entertainment and productivity and, you know, all sorts of, you know, all the kinds of things you do now. And so we started, you know, putting GPS in the phone and software downloads. We did the first smartphone, did all these multimedia in the phone, all these, all these kinds of things. And that was a great vision. And that actually was the thing that drove the growth of the company kind of in the, in the best years of my tenure. You know, we were growing 30% per year um, because we had gotten in the right place. And when the when the iPhone really helped tip that over into um, mainstream adoption, then the fact that we had built you know, microprocessors and graphic processors and digital processors and multimedia capability and all these things, we were in the right place to really accelerate that at the time. So everybody gets that now, and so the question is, what's next? And when I left, the, there were a few things that we were really looking at uh, or pushing as a vision, but I think the one that's probably the most consumer focused is this notion of the digital sixth sense, that the phone will actually give you this ability to merge cyberspace and physical space and, you know, great example of, you know, it kind of gives you these superhuman powers in a certain way. Um, you know, we're working with car manufacturers where you use augmented reality to see through the doors of the car so when you're parking you can actually see the curb next to the car or look back and, you know, that kind of stuff. I can I can actually read Chinese characters now, not because I can read them directly, but I point my phone at the Chinese characters and I couldn't even sound them out before. Now I know exactly what it says and the world became clickable. And so all those kinds of things, and it's kind of based on this notion that everything's going to be connected and wireless is going to be an enabling technology for so many other industries now. And so, so that's, that's kind of the, the, the consumer edge of of what we're doing, and there's just huge opportunities there. So. Um, so we'll get back to the digital sixth sense and All what right. that means for, for Qualcomm in a moment. But I, I want to get back to the leadership question for a moment. Uh, you have had some distance now, a year, since you stepped out of the CEO, CEO role. And for many of you uh, who might not have closely followed the machination, this was a remarkable um, selfless act because I think you've said publicly that you probably stepped down a little before you intended to, but Steve Mollenkopf, who's the current CEO, was rumored to be potentially jumping ship to run Microsoft, and so this was a retention strategy to keep him at Qualcomm by virtue of Paul volunteering to step, step down earlier. But I you, look at it as stepping up, but <laughs> Stepping up, okay. Oh. So when you now look back and you have the distance, and it's a very, very difficult role to be in, to be actually the ex-CEO with all of your ties to Qualcomm and, quote, looking over the shoulder of the new CEO. So that's a very delicate role. Yep. But when you, when you look back and say, okay, I now have a year of perspective, w would you have done anything differently in your leadership role? No, I, I actually think it's worked out extremely well. I mean, we had a very tough thing that happened right away was the whole China 
situation, and we all we all just pitched in. Um, I was in China five times between June and January, so it was it, there was a lot, and I wasn't. And the, the one China was situation lead. is. Uh, with the NDRC, which used to be the State Planning Commission, and it has the, they, China has this uh, anti-monopoly law, so they w wanted to use that as a way to negotiate our um, uh, our royalty rates and, and sort and of how the chip business works and all. You know, not just directed at chip companies, but also at automakers. Oh well, so the the NDRC is sort of expanding its mandate. Um, you know, it was the State Planning Commission, so that was almost probably was the most important agency in the, um, in the Chinese government at a time when they were more centrally controlled and less market oriented. And so I think this anti-monopoly law is, uh, it's now their, one of their main focuses. So yeah, the auto manufacturers were in there and a bunch of different companies have gone through these things, which are never, never very fun. But I would say that, you know, government Government regulators all around the world, it's, you know, it's not just China. It's easy for us to sit here and say, oh, China is doing this, that, and the other thing. But you know, the FTC jumped in in the middle of the NDRC in investigation. The, you know, the uh, Koreans jumped in. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of government involvement in business at the moment. And, so back and, to the uh, question of, of yeah. leadership. You wouldn't have done anything Different. No, I, I think um, I really, really tried hard to let Steve articulate what he wanted to do. And it's a different time in the company in the sense that, you know, I had 30% growth for three years in a row. And the end market of smartphones, you know, its, it's growth rates are slowing a little bit. And our, you know, we've taken a lot of share. So, yeah, there's... There are a lot of growth opportunities ahead, but right now it's a little bit of a, you know, a slowdown. So we're like single, high single digit, maybe low double digit growth rates. And in that kind of a time frame, you got to focus in more on operational excellence and uh, combating complacency is a big, big issue for them. But managing costs and, and those kinds of things are, are a really big issue. So in that transition, you know, he's gone after some of the things that were my pet projects. It's fine though. I recognize that there's a time and a place for a certain set of investments and there's another time and a place for another set of investments. And so we're we spend a lot of those a lot of time doing that. But I'm not, you know, I don't I'm not making the choice. And and by the way, I never did that. I mean my the whole way that I was able to scale the company was that I didn't try and make every decision I wanted to. And I, my saying about my father is being a founder, he made every decision he wanted to, and I didn't, because I was willing to delegate not just responsibility to people, but authority to people. I would sit in a room with people and say, they'd say, what do you want us to do? And I'd say, you make the call, because it's your business, and I'll let you know what happened later, whether you got it right or not. And, you know, that's fair. It's fair. So anyway, so, so that made it easy for me, in a certain sense, like from a mindset, it was easier for me to say, okay, hey, you're the guy who's the CEO now. You have the operational responsibility for the company. And it was fun, too, for me because I got to go spend more time with the CTO and some of my friends you know, in engineering that I've done projects with in the past. And it's what I love to do anyway, so it wasn't so hard. But then China got in the way, and we spent a little bit of time on that, too. So, so let's talk about China um, and growth. The, the, the China issue um, resulted in a, a settlement of close to a billion dollars. Some companies might say, this might give us pause. Do we, do we want to continue expanding there? Uh, and yet, part of your growth has been, a large part of your growth has been outside the United States. Do you see future growth being uh, new people gravitating to new phones? Or is it upgrades of smartphones? Is it new markets? Or is it entirely new product lines as you think about this digital sixth sense? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, okay, so the base market is continuing to grow well. I mean, we're projecting, you know, 10 to 12 percent growth in volume of, of smartphones over the year. And not only will the smartphones continue to grow, but we're trying to increase our share of the content in the phone. So we've done things around you know, more of the radio chips for us, more of the connectivity chips. 
We have you know, some kind of speculative investments in display technologies, which haven't turned out perfectly yet, but you know, it's sort of indicative of the idea that you want to expand the content. Um, then there's new applications, so computing's a clear one, and we haven't done as well as we'd like in the tablet space. I mean, it's been fine, but Android tablets haven't taken off so well, um, and the ones that have have been mostly Wi-Fi and not cellular connected. So we have a whole set of initiatives in computing, uh, which I think will will pay off over the next you know some odd years. Um, but the trends are right. We have the right power consumption. We have we, there's all sorts of reasons why uh, why computing will go increasingly towards chips that come out of the mobile space, and we have a server initiative and and so forth. So so those so that's there, and then. And then there's things like, you know, just wireless as an enabling technology. Um, there's, you know, automotive, there's healthcare, there's smart cities, there's all these kinds of things. And in some cases, you know, people talk about this internet of everything, there'll be low value devices. Yeah, for sure, there's gonna be lots of, you know, motion sensors and temperature trackers and stuff like that that'll be very low value, but there'll be healthcare things that'll be very high value. And, you know, and I think over time we'll even see technology that's inside our bodies continually monitoring biomarkers in our blood and alerting us way ahead of time that you're going to have some health condition that you need to manage before it becomes bad. Well, that, those kinds of things will be very high value. Will we, will we build those sensors? I don't know. Will we build the enabling technology for them? I mean, we're going to, we'll try very hard to be the ones that are doing that. Um, cars are a really interesting opportunity right now because of this whole trend towards more automated driving of the car. And to do that, you need all sorts of sensors in the car so it can understand the environment that it's in. You need connectivity so that it can pull down information about what's going on in the world around it and get maps and all sorts of up-to-date information. And so a lot of the capabilities that are in the car right now will use technologies that we have in the smartphone. So the computer vision technologies that we use That'll allow the car to know where it is. Obviously, the position location technologies. Obviously, a lot of the connectivity technologies. Um, you know, one of the things that's kind of a fun example along those lines, we just did a, a sponsorship with the Mercedes uh, Formula One team because we have this really high data rate technology that works in a short area, and they want the car, when it's coming into the pits, to be able to upload information of the infrared cameras looking at their tires because they want to know how the tires are wearing and you, it's just huge amounts of data. So that, that they, they don't really, have to change them every time if yeah, it's they want to know when they, I mean it's a huge issue. Tires, mm -hmm. in fact they just lost the last race in Malaysia because their tires, tires wore faster than, mm -hmm. than the other guys. So really cool kind of stuff and I mean, another thing along those lines, you know, you're going to have the car talk to other cars, going to talk to the infrastructure, uh, it'll talk to people's smartphones. There's 13 pedestrian fatalities a day from a car hitting a pedestrian in the United States. And in the future, the car is going to be able to tell the smartphones and the people in the area around them, watch out, this car is coming too fast into this stoplight that's red, or you know those kinds of things. And we're working on those kind of technologies already. So high value opportunities there. There's some low value ones, but very large volumes. Uh, so all sorts of interesting things. Um, there are, I'll just follow up. Uh, on, on one piece of what you said, so, so you're a, a very large-scale company now, 110, 115 billion in market cap, tons. Depends on the day. Depends on the day, <laughs> right? Um, and um, thousands of employees also in R&D. And at this point, with your scale, you, you have to be doing very fundamental R&D for things that may pan out or things that may be absolute bombs. Yep. How do you balance that? focus with the need to be an experimenter, an inventor, and the inevitable failure that happens from yeah. these. I mean, it, I think that you have to be willing to fail and, and take risks in order to be an innovator. It's just going to happen. You're not going to be right all the time. If you're right all the time, you know, it's like they say in skiing, you never fall, you're not pushing it hard enough. And I think it's, it's the same kind of thing. You want to you, it's okay to make mistakes as long as you don't make a career of it. You don't want to, you know, make mistakes all the time but you want to have a portfolio. And the way that we look at it is we have a, a, some set of projects that are big investments that we have more confidence in, or we believe the payoff is so big, we're willing to take that bet even when it's a lower probability of success. 
all the way down to tiny projects which are you know individual engineers and a few buddies working on some project together and so um, so the fact that we have sort of that tiering of them you can fail at certain points in them but even a very large thing where you fail you know the, the market doesn't necessarily beat you up that much about those kinds of things I mean our investments in um, in the display business, you know, we've written off a factory. I mean, we built the whole factory, and we just we we thought we were going to build the color screen for e-readers, and we needed you know that much glass to go through the factory, and pretty much people for color e-readers just use their tablet now, and so we you know that market didn't didn't turn out, but we wrote that off, and people were actually were happier because they said, well, that isn't working. Them writing it off means that they're not going to be spending you know you know. Um, Income, you know, the income is going to go up, so they're not going to spend uh, R and D or opex on oh, it. Oh, talk uh, about media flow. flow. How you actually yeah, did a save on that one? Media flow was great. I mean, media flow was a uh, was a nationwide TV system. It was uh, basically a, we bought Spectrum, we built out a network. So this was sort of running in parallel with the cellular network, and we went to the cellular operators to sell. We didn't try and sell it direct. We said, "This is a new service for you. Your networks won't really handle." enough video so this is a way to get video down to the phones and give give people what they want and I knew it was a really hard project I mean I took it on because I'm like if we can do this it's great and hard for other people to do um, so we had to negotiate all the rights deals and all sorts of stuff and in the end what happened was the pricing was high enough that people didn't really want to pay again for video on their cell phone when they were already paying their cable provider and, and so forth. Um, the service was great for the people that used it, but not enough people used it. So we shut it down. Uh, we took a write down on all those towers and uh, amplifiers and transmitters and all this stuff that was out there in the network. And, uh, but we, re we took the lessons from it and we actually built what's called LTE Broadcast, or it actually has a different name in the industry, which is lame. But anyways, it's a broadcast system on the LTE network, which is now launching. And so all the ideas of how to make the system more dynamic because it turned out that most people only wanted to watch real-time video when it was like a sporting event or breaking news or Michael Jackson's funeral was like one of the biggest events on media flow um, and so that kind of stuff but when it came to watching shows nobody went to their phone at five o'clock to watch whatever the sitcom you know that just didn't happen um, so you really wanted that to be more on demand and so the new system is all on demand then we came up with a different technology to use the spectrum. So the spectrum that we bought for a few hundred million dollars, we sold for a couple billion dollars for what's called supplemental downlink. And not only that, actually a cool thing is that we had another chunk that we had bought in the UK for MediaFlow, which we still own. And we just recently got that harmonized across all of Europe. So we own this incredibly valuable chunk of spectrum now in the UK, which will now, we're running an auction among people. So That'll help pay back uh, the costs. And that's lemonade out of lemon. Yeah, I mean, I try and do that. I, I always have plan A, plan A, plan A, then B, C, D. You know, I mean, I, I really try and make sure that you have a direction you want to go. So I wanted video on the devices. How am I going to get it there? And supplemental downlink and the LTE broadcast and all these things are just a different way of getting it there. Learning the lesson it was an expensive lesson, but not that expensive once we were able to sell this back and get the money back. Um, you gave some examples, and, and I mean this embracing vision of the digital sixth sense takes you into uh, devices that are very smart, very, very smart, right. thinking devices, and into AI. So uh, there are various um, phenomenal applications. I, I, I love Watson. Um, I mean, we're all going to be healthier because of Watson, which is IBM's AI system that aggregates medical intelligence information. But then there are also those that foresee a very dark world where you go to turn the device off and it says, no, 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 don't turn me off, yeah. turn yourself off. <laughs> exactly. And so, so how, do you, how do you see the direction of AI proceeding and, and the quest that we have for continuous knowledge yeah. and at the same time consideration yeah. of those implications. I mean there's two two big existential threats I think for for humanity. One is bioterrorism and the other is sort of AI. And AI is probably a little farther out there than 
bioterrorism is. And, um, you know, it seems like science fiction, except you start using these systems and they do things that are incredibly biological. Uh, they look at things, they can focus on stuff, they can learn. Uh, people don't really understand exactly what they're doing inside. They're making their own models inside. So it used to be that human beings would build these expert systems and you'd have experts try and make models and everything. And they worked okay. But now the way the technology works is you just put layers of these networks in and the computer makes the model. And it's very overloaded, meaning that you know the same, same functional element might participate in multiple different decision paths like the way your brain works. And um, so we just showed off stuff at the latest Mobile World Congress, a thing that I've been wanting for a very long time, which was I want my phone to recognize faces. I don't, I don't have very good software in my own brain on recognizing faces, so I always wanted my phone to whisper in my ear, that's so-and-so, and you met him this time, and here's the stories that you exchange, you know, make it sound like I really had this phenomenal memory. Well, that actually, actually is happening now. I mean, that is a feasible thing to do today. And it's just from training these networks on a large set of faces, and then you can add additional ones. And the, the text recognition stuff, that all, a lot of that works that way. Um, Watson, as you talked about. I mean, there's lots of examples of, of you know, some of this computer vision things that, things that we're doing. I mean, these things all work by these systems that, that are very biologically inspired in a certain way. And but where so do you, you just, see the threat? Where do you well, just the question. I mean, nobody knows whether this computing fabric and, you know, Where's my phone? You know, this, this computing fabric, are they fundamentally different? Or if this gets to a certain scale, will it become self-aware and, and, you know, like you've seen in the movies? Um, and we don't know the answer to that right now. And so there's, um, at Cambridge, you know, Stephen Hawking's been one who's talked about this. And I uh, just, in the process of reading this book by a professor there. And, you know, they set up a, a a center for existential risk, where they actually want to try and build some technologies into the system. So, an example that they give in this book that I'm reading is, you know, the the um, circuit breakers in the stock market, because you have this very high-speed trading, and a human being couldn't actually stop the meltdown. So, you have an automatic circuit breaker that stops some phenomenon that's going in the wrong direction. Now, I'm not saying that's the answer, um, but that's what they're proposing, things that are kind of like that. That we, instead of building the technology first and guessing how we're going to control it later, they're like, well, maybe we should spend a little bit of effort figuring out how we might manage the technology before we build it. So I know it sounds science fiction-y and crazy, but it's the, the pace at which the technology, artificial intelligence, got better just makes you worry that you know on an exponential, as opposed to a linear extrapolation, things could change radically quickly and you just wouldn't, you know, it would just happen. You wouldn't realize, oh my God, we just passed the point. And so a lot of people, a lot of people in the industry are, you know, are worrying about this now. So it's, that's good. And, you know. So we have an alumnus, an alumnae called Martine Rothblatt. Mm -hmm. and, she, and she's contemplated in that book the whole process of citizenship. Once you get to thinking beings through artific thinking machines through artificial intelligence, what rights do they have as citizens? Do they vote? What, what rights do we have? That's the yeah. question. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, you can get to a very quick, interesting discussion yeah. about humanity. Yeah. Um, I don't me, want to be a downer, but. Uh, <laughs> let me, and, and the movies become true, yeah. Uh, let me ask a very retro question in the context of this discussion, and that is, you know, we have a program, and uh, uh, a program called the Eastern Technology Management Program, because we believe that there's something different about managing technology firms as opposed to, let's say, packaged good firms or consumer product firms, etc. How would you answer that? question, is there something different about managing a technology firm, about leading a technology firm? Uh, I think the one thing that, <clears throat> that we see as an imperative is that we, we don't want to be commoditized. Um, 
we feel like the technology treadmill, you want to run on the technology treadmill as fast as you can. And actually, the barriers that you build to competition hurt you more in the long run than you think that it allows you to be slower and complacent and so forth. So that the notion that you just got to always be innovating, you have to be looking for input from very many different sources. Um, and not trying to, not spending so much of your time building barriers, I think that's actually the, the kind of the critical difference. I mean, if you look at a lot of, you know, commodity businesses, that's, I mean, their whole goal is to, how do I build a fortress so that nobody comes and steals, you know, my soda water or my, you know, whatever, whatever it is, my Kleenex is my whatever it is. And I, I, I think in technology, you know, it's, it's all about keeping the people engaged, feeling that they have a mission to go march on, keeping their passion and harnessing their passion and you know, give them sort of a, a direction to go and be persistent but also recognize there are times when an obstacle is going to come up and you have to have ways around that. It's not just you know, straight ahead and, and go after it. And so I think it's sort of all those, those kinds of things. And Qualcomm's really interesting because we don't really manage in a hierarchical fashion at all. It's, um, it's all about who's creating value in a conversation. If an issue comes up, people self-organize to go fix it, and email threads come up, or wiki pages come up, and you, know, you go after the problem, solve it, and people go off to the next thing. And I think it was hard for some, some people who came in from other companies, even people who came coming in from other tech companies, to deal with the fact that information didn't just kind of flow up. It sort of mushed around and you had to be involved to know what was going on. Now obviously, you know, there's legal and finance and those kinds of things where there are certain structures that convey information. I'm not trying to give you the sense that it's just willy-nilly. But the real, the fundamental things where problems got solved and people swarmed to an issue and dealt with it or some new opportunity arose, a lot of those things they self-assemble. And I think that flexibility is really important. And in fact, it's one of the things that I'm sort of combating right now in Qualcomm is that we've put a little more process in place than I would like. And I think it hinders growth. And it gives people a place to hide, too. It gives them the ability to say no to things because some far out corner case of this issue with this policy was made of that could happen and it could threaten everything. And you're like, yeah, but that's incredibly unlikely. And in the very unlikely case that happens, we'll figure out a way to deal with that issue. You know, don't prejudge that. Don't spend all your creativity like trying to wander down such a bad space to say no to things. So, so having that kind of some rigidity allows people to hide behind those things. I actually think it's, um, I think it's, a, it's dangerous for a tech company. You know, you mentioned the word commodity and that you want to avoid commoditization. So, so I don't know if, if this is the right connection, but the Samsung decision to not use your processor in the, in the new S6, I mean, could be because this is already something that, I mean, their vertical integration is already um, around a product that is somewhat commoditized for you and you're into the next frontier. I, I, is that how you view it's, the vertical integration that might happen? Is that a threat to you? It's, it's always a threat. I mean, our customers are always examining how much more vertical they can be. Samsung certainly has a set of capabilities, but there was, there was a lot of perfect storm things that happened there. It was, uh, there was a transition from a 32-bit processor to a 64-bit processor. It was a transition of process technology nodes. It was sort of some internal things that were going on there. Um, and you know, the next chip is on the newest process technology node, and it's got our own internally developed processors and all sorts of stuff. So I think we're not complacent about it. I think we're definitely focused on this issue, but it's not, a, it's not like the sky is falling and the, the model has collapsed. That's not what's going on. On the other hand, what you said is absolutely right. I mean, we have to keep <clears throat> pushing into new areas. If we aren't driving the next new thing, then we deserve to be commoditized. And so that's why having this sequence of visions I always felt was so, so important because it kept people thinking, I don't want to 
build my fortress on this mountain because the next mountain's there and I gotta go climb that mountain too. And there's, by the way, I mean, when we look at Internet of Things, I mean, the business model's different. In smartphone arena, we sell to a small number of customers, Samsung being one of them. Uh, it's like hand-to-hand -hand combat. You are there in with their teams. They have an issue. You swarm to that team. You bring in massive resources to deal with it. Um, and you, that's fine, by the way. I'm good with cell phones. Ringing. Don't, don't worry about it. In the, in the Internet of Things, it might be thousands of companies, tens of thousands of companies who really want, they want help. They want to be able to use your product and build with it, but you can't afford for the volume and the size that they might be to give them that same amount of resources and, and support. So there's a different selling model, a different customer support model. So we're retooling ourselves that way too. So at the same time, we're managing this huge smartphone business which continues to grow and generate great revenues and generate great profitability. We also have to say, okay, what's our next act and how do we redo ourselves? And so we bought this company, CS, or we're in the process of buying a company called CSR that was more of a catalog business around, you know, kind of smaller devices, smaller connectivity and so forth. And, and it's those kinds of things that help us also sort of transition from one phase to another phase. Let me ask maybe the last question before I turn it over to our students uh, for, uh, for the remainder. And, and, and that was around succession. Uh, I, I think that it, it, people were able to, to miss perceive what really happened in terms of your transition into the leadership role from your father's mm -hmm. when it was already a very large public company. And some could take a cheap shot and say, well, that was easy. He's, he's got the right gene pool. My sense is that if it was they probably... Said that, that was nice. It was, yeah. They said My he had sense, the right connections mostly. Yeah. But. <laughs> uh, well, that's... Uh, uh, I, my sense is that it was probably tougher to get the role as... Uh, as a person with the same last name as the founder. And then contrast that transition to this succession yeah. when you moved from you to Steve. Um, so my last question to the board committee that was doing the succession planning at the time I took over from my father was, am I a hard choice for you for exactly that reason? And they said, yeah, because there it was very easy for the board to be second-guessed over that. Now. The truth of the matter is I, had already, I was already a leader in the company, a very senior leader, and it was a time of transition from really being completely about the radio to being driven by the apps. And as I said earlier, I was the guy who really started that inside Qualcomm, looking at the system as a pipe and what is it that you can put on the outside of that. Not to say that I didn't work on the radio stuff too, but you know, it, was, it was really in the service of different applications. So the timing was good for that transition, I mean, obviously, it's not that my father didn't also think about applications too, but he wasn't into it the same way I was, and just like I wasn't into the radio the same way and he was. And you had so. a hugely established track record as yeah, a scientist. Yeah, a good track record. So, mm -hmm. and I had lots of patents and lots of projects, and so mm -hmm. people knew me inside the company. So, so that made it easier. But from an external standpoint, for sure, it was harder, and you had to work twice as hard and prove yourself more. But the thing I always used to say that was to my advantage was if you walked into a meeting with somebody and they thought you were the idiot kid who got the job because you were the kid of the founder, that meant they were going to underestimate you in a certain way. And it's great. That's actually a good position to be in when you're negotiating. You want the people to think you're an idiot. It's, it's okay. So, so that actually worked to my advantage, I think. Um, and, and, and I just didn't, you know, I just, it didn't get to me. I didn't ever, people think that it's weird, but it didn't, feel like a monkey on my back at all. I just felt like, hey, I get to stand on the shoulder of a giant. I have this other thing I want to go do. It's not the same thing he did. I have a different idea. Um, the transition with Steve, I think there's a certain aspect of more of the same where we just worked together for so long in a very collaborative fashion. And we don't, there's no sort of, there was a little father-son dynamic between me and Erwin where there became a time when I'd say black, he'd say white, and he'd say black, I'd say white, and so forth. Um, you know, Steve and I don't have that, that issue at all. In fact, we learned a lesson pretty early on when he took over the chip business where he was very open to a new technology that I had been pushing, 
brought it into the chip business much earlier than it had been done before, and it actually failed. It was not cooked enough for them to take it and productize it and drive it into the market. So we actually have experiences together of when is the right time to really push the next new thing. And, and so I think we have a pretty balanced, balanced approach on that. So I think it was good. I mean, we, we tried to articulate that to the employee base, and I think that went well. I think we articulated, articulated it pretty well to the investor base. You know, now, you know, there's, you know, the stock's not where we want it to be, and we're trying to figure out, okay, what are the right things to drive shareholder value and things like that, and I think, you know, that'll be a partnership too. And you've trained people to go to him rather than to you. For yeah, the, for I... The right for the right decisions. I really, but like I said, I mean, that was always my inclination. Just, it's, I don't think you can delegate without delegating everything. You can't tell somebody they have the responsibility without the authority, because if you tell them the decision and something, they hit an obstacle, which they'll always hit some obstacle, I don't want them to be able to go, that wasn't my thing, Paul said to do that. You know, I want them to say, no, I own that decision, I'm going to go solve it. And if they have an issue, they want to come talk to me, which of course would happen, I'll tell them my opinion, but not necessarily in front of their whole team, they'll go off and do it. And so the same thing works here. I don't have, you know, I can talk to Steve behind the scenes, I can talk to other people behind the scenes too, I mean, we're all friends, so there's not a big, in fact, I would say there's essentially no politics at the senior level of Qualcomm. It's all about we're friends, we hang out together, we solve problems together. People don't say, oh, you're stepping into my turf when you help somebody. They're like, oh, thanks for the help. You had a different point of view or you had more bandwidth. You know, so all those kinds of things help mitigate the issues that you might perceive as happening. But with all that said, I mean, it's only a year in and I mean, I could screw it up still, so. <laughs> um, would you line up next to the, uh, speak of the microphones and with questions, please? I'll keep asking as you think and, and go for it. I'll ask one, another question, but feel free to line up. Uh, you, you know, you uh, just, you being the company, just instituted a stock buyback plan of $15 billion, and without getting into the, um, the specifics, wh why would a company want to do that and why would a board push back or not? So what are the pros and cons on both sides? So, the, so part of that buyback went to just balance out the fact that we use equity as a compensation tool and we were diluting shareholders and people don't like that that much and particularly when you're not growing at 30% per year, they really don't like it. So. You have to at least balance that out. And then beyond that, they want to see you return capital to shareholders. And there's, you, know, you can do it in a couple of ways. You can either give them a dividend, which is generally not that tax efficient and doesn't have the forward power of saying, I can reduce my share count, so my EPS, you get some EPS growth out of just reducing the share count. So, um, so, th so that's kind of why you do it. And we went back and forth on, dividends versus buybacks, buybacks versus holding it. Do we have enough cash for the M&A that might happen? You know, the semiconductor space is consolidating right now. We wanted to make sure that if there were things that we wanted to play in that might be larger, we wanted to do that, or we wanted to be able to do that. So what we did was, and we had done this over time, set up what our kind of cash that we wanted to hold was for opportunities. Um, and then said, okay, we'll return the rest of the shareholders. And we were in the process of doing that. And the buyback, for me, I'm very much a proponent of opportunistic buyback. So we did that mostly in the past. I think there were shareholders that argued we didn't you know, necessarily do big enough ones when we had the opportunity. So this time we said, okay, well, we'll put in place a, a larger, uh, a larger buyback. Mm -hmm. and it's fine, you know, there are times when you get frustrated with it, like you announce a $10 billion buyback and your stock goes down, but you know, the markets, it moves around so much. So you, you have to believe in, in the future of the company and say, okay, well we think this is actually an accelerator opportunity, we can buy back when we perceive that it's a good opportunity and then, then when the future comes and those growth you know, re reignites or we do some you know, cost savings efforts or whatever it is that generates more net income, that'll show up as, as a, a bigger accelerator for, uh, for EPS. So, so that's kind of the main thing. The other thing that's the wrinkle is that 
we have a lot of offshore cash. And the reason why we have it is because most of the manufacturing of cell phone, well, all of the manufacturing, I think, probably has moved offshore. And so that's where we sell our chips. The licensing business revenues are counted as onshore revenues anyways, but the chip business revenues are generally offshore. And that you can't really bring back without paying a very stiff penalty in terms of taxes. So it's, a, it's an odd thing, but the US government incents companies to buy companies offshore, to invest in R&D offshore, to do you know, capital expansion projects. Off, I mean, it's a horrible policy. It's, one of the stupidest things I know of, but um, there's a few others, but that one sticks, sticks out. And hopefully that gets changed. I mean, there's a little bit of a wind blowing in Washington right now for repatriation and comprehensive tax reform. And you know, we're one of the few countries that doesn't have a territorial tax system. But even if we keep a worldwide tax system and just have a reasonable rate on the offshore income, that money will flow back here. Um, and then that actually will change a lot. I mean, you'll see a lot of companies do things around dividends and share buybacks and investment and so forth. I think you know, if, the, if Congress could get around to changing the way that that offshore cash is treated, it would be very good for the economy. So you playing those things off as well and playing sort of debt ratio. You know, it's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Okay, first question. Please introduce yourself in the back. In the back. Thank you. Yep. Um, my name is Naveen Daftari. I'm an MFE student here. I uh, just want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, my background is actually circuit design, so this is a bit of a selfish question. Um, All right. You need you a know, job. No, no. <laughs> no, not, not yet. Um, <laughs> well, let and me know when you do. Please, <laughs> and, and please take pity on us non-techies <laughs> in the you, question. I'll, I'll go as, as light as I can. Um, you actually touched on briefly about um, how valuable low frequency spectrum is. You sold, you know, for your 700 megahertz spectrum for like billions. Right. Right. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on what what you feel is the future of higher frequency spectrum markets. There's a slowly growing 60 gigahertz market. Yep. E-band communications. You guys just yep. bought Wilocity, I think, yep. six months ago. Do you feel like this is the future of wireless communications? Thank you. It's it is definitely a huge part of it. So the issue is that when you have low frequencies. What it is good for is when they build the cell tower outside the building, it's easier for the radio waves to get in and talk to your cell phone inside the building and vice versa. When your phone talks, it's easier for it to get outside. When you have these very high frequencies, the kind that he was talking about, your, the human body can even stop them uh, sometimes, get in the way. Um, so the question is how do you use those? And the answer is there are other things that you can do given those high frequencies. Um, you, can, you can actually point the the energy around much easier. Uh, and so, um, so people are looking at those very high frequencies. And, and the other thing is that the network, the cellular network is getting built out more densely. The original idea was that you went from the outside in, you built big towers outside and beamed energy into buildings. I think in the future, there's going to be more of the network will be built indoors, more like Wi-Fi access points. And then energy will actually leak outside. The radio waves will leak outside and you'll get coverage outside. And when you build that way, you have lots and lots of very cheap cell sites. The fact that you're closer between your phone and the cell site or that little access point means that you actually get higher data rates. So the 60 gigahertz, not only are you close, you have this lot, you have a very wide amount of spectrum to use. And so we get gigabits per second over the 60, gigabit ra 60 gigahertz radios. And that will allow you to do things like drive a screen. When you Today, when you have your phone, it has this technology over Wi-Fi where you can drive a screen that you come up to and you can play your videos or your pictures on. But it's pretty kludgy and it's slow and doesn't really work quite right. In the future, with a 60 gigahertz radio, you literally are going to sit down, you put your device down on the table, it will light up the screen. The screen will look to the phone as just an extension of its internal hardware. Not like, oh, I have to send something off to some other thing. Um, and so that's going to work really well, particularly in conjunction with wireless power. So you're not even going to have to plug anything in. You just put the device down. So now when you think about not using a laptop at all, you know, you'll be using screens on a very ad hoc basis with these. You'll be using memory. The memory will be distributed throughout the world. And the reason is because you're going to have these very high bandwidth files or streams that you want to have uh, access to. And your connection to the 
public internet, the public cloud, will be in tens of megabits per second, and your connection in the local area will be gigabits per second. So all of this means that these high frequencies are going to be very useful, very valuable. Um, you'll be able to use them in small areas. You actually can contain the interference from one cell, one access point to another because of this. All sorts of technical reasons why this stuff will be good. And the other reason why it's good is because there's just a lot of spectrum up there. And the more spectrum you have, the more stuff you can pump down that, that spectrum. So um, I'm actually really excited about it. I, I actually think 60 gigahertz is going to be one of the big reasons why people will buy new phones in the next few years. Because, I mean, I don't know how many you, you do this, but if you ever downloaded like a video file, you, know, you want to watch some show on your tablet or on your phone or whatever, and you download it over Wi-Fi, I mean, even at 100 megabits per second, it takes a long time. This stuff will be like, boom, quick, super quick. So it's just downloading things that you want to watch your phone, uploading the content from your phone to, you know, in full fidelity to the server in your house and eventually trickled out to the cloud. All that stuff's going to be really, really easy in the future, so. Okay, uh, front. And, and maybe we can make the questions and answers short All so right. we can get some. I can make the shorter, I can make shorter <laughs> answers, I think. Introduce yourself, please. My name is Arthur. I'm a first year in the full-time uh, program here. Thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Uh, my question is regarding acquisitions and how Qualcomm approaches um, unlocking value through acquisitions, uh, especially through the uh, post-merger integration uh, cycle. Okay, so we've only done a few big ones. So most of our acquisitions have been sort of what I'd say technology tuck-in, like somebody invented some set of technology and we wanted to pull that in. Uh, but we did buy a Theros, and that was our largest acquisition to date. And that was really about buying sales channels as well. The reason why that worked well was we knew them quite well even beforehand. We had worked closely with them ahead of time, so the teams all knew each other. And even then, after a certain period of time, the senior leadership of, of a Theros, many of those people have, have left to go on to, to other companies. But, but the core of the the business is, is still there and the, you know, the vast majority of the people are, are still there. So, yeah, um, it's, there's nothing easy about doing integration, particularly of a large um, acquisition. Um, I'm not sure yet whether we're experts at it or not, but we're, we're not terrible at it either. And it's an area that we're definitely focused on because we are doing some larger acquisitions again. We have CSR that I mentioned is also products and channels and people, particularly people um, in uh, other countries. So we have techniques to do it, but it's, I think um, we're still in the learning process on getting better and better at that. Is that short enough? That was great. Thank right. you. <laughs> I, the, I can follow the, directions. You probably, you probably didn't answer the front end of the question. That's oh. how you decide. But, but like, How do we decide like, which one? How, how do you decide? You, well, it was, the, it was technology tuck-ins mm -hmm. or new channels, yeah. new, new sales channels. Okay, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Kishan and I'm a part-time MBA student here. I work for Intel on uh, graphics processors. My question is regarding the, uh, the outlook for uh, the smartphone space. How do you think the competition is gonna play out in terms of innovation and in terms of uh, who's gonna be competing with who in the next few years? Uh, so there's different, so you have the high end of the market where you have the Apple and Samsung, they're taking most of the share and both of them have certain aspects of verticalization. So there'll be the competition with the manufacturer themselves building the chipsets for the smartphone and then there'll be the competition of Qualcomm, Intel's trying to get in the space, MediaTek a little below us trying to come up and then the sort of the uh, Chinese domestic guys, the spread from and so forth, trying to come up below them. And, and so uh, it's quite dynamic. There's different opportunities in different parts of the space. Um, I mean, I like our position, but clearly, um, I actually just heard this yesterday, that uh, the Intel CFO predicted they'll have 50% share of baseband's in two years. So that's like the kind of thing that you put up on the locker room wall. It's great. Um, so it's good. I actually think if you don't have competition, you get lazy and slow and you know, fat, dumb, and happy. And I don't want to be that way, so um, I like to be happy, but fat and dumb is not so good. 
Um, and uh, anyway, so you know, there's there's going to be competition, and it's going to be come from various different sources, and um, and then you have governments. I mean, you have governments that are involved in trying to build national champions at in uh, in China, as an example, and I think you'll see that in in other places to the extent that they're able to do that. Uh, the market's fragmenting a little bit now. I mean, there's certainly the growth of the um, the smaller Chinese manufacturers, that some of which are growing up to be global players now. I think that's a trend that's actually good for a horizontal business, which most of the you know most of the merchant semi, uh, I guess all of the merchant semi guys are. So. Um, so the market, I think, is maybe even getting a little better, although right now, obviously, with the iPhone 6 and success coming out, you know, Apple's taking a huge share of the premium tier. So that looks actually more concentrated, but the rest of the market probably looks more, more open. So it's, uh, in the end, the way you win is by out-executing, by, by out-innovating, um, and that's what we're focused on doing. Okay. My name is uh, Yang An. I'm from Taiwan, and uh, I thank you for coming here. I'm the first year Anderson student. Uh, I helped uh, some uh, Chinese uh, IC design company, like trying to find their like uh, next uh, like market. And many of them uh, say it's the automotive, which you have also mentioned uh, previously. So can you like uh, uh, explain or narrate more about that automotive, like IC design application on the automotive market? Yeah. Thank you. So the automotive market is, I mean, you, I think we all know that sort of the systems, the electronic systems inside the car are becoming more and more important, whether it's how you connect your multimedia into the car, or how you have you know, traffic information and routing and all these kinds of um, things. So there's that aspect of the automotive market that's increasing. There's also the, the just everybody wants their cars to be connected now, so the market the manufacturers are opening up the opportunity for, for you to put connectivity in the car, independent of everything. But then once they put connectivity in the car, they recognize that a smartphone chip can drive their whole in-car entertainment and navigation and all their other systems. So now you have the opportunity to sort of grow the share into those, those parts of the, of the car. And then as you look farther out, the car is doing more uh, driver assistance or more communication with the other cars and the network and so forth, there's other you know, tremendous opportunities there. The other thing that's an interesting twist too is that the car manufacturers are increasingly metalizing the windows, which means that you just getting in your cell phone, getting in your car with your cell phone, the cell phone won't actually be able to communicate well with the tower outside, so people are looking at actually putting cell sites inside the car the car would actually be driving around with a little cell site. Now that drives the wireless operators crazy if they think you know, that's going through their carefully planned network. But I think with some of these small cell technologies where the, the uh, cell sites actually adapt to each other and maybe even doing it in the unlicensed band, that'll be a way to get around that, that kind of issue. So, so we lots of opportunities. Yeah, and we absolutely have to have driverless cars because we're basically going to have our office in our car and yep. it will be all crashing unless they're driverless. I'm going to ask the last question and maybe 1.1 questions. The, the last question is, you know, we talk about thinking in the next as UCLA Anderson and the three essential qualities of our community are sharing success, thinking fearlessly, and driving change. It seems to me that this fits you and Qualcomm to a T. So would you talk about how those three qualities, share success, think fearlessly, and and drive change matter that this is such a great match yeah I mean, I, I, so we we use it we use those ideas all the time I mean, the thinking fearlessly I think it's very easy to look at kind of a matrix say conventional thinking and unconventional thinking and are you right or are you wrong well if you think conventionally then if you're right it's great, but everybody else thought that way. You don't really have a great success. If you think, if you're wrong, well, everybody else thought that way. So you weren't, you know, how can you blame me? Everybody thought that. So you've got to be in that fearless part where you're thinking unconventionally, where when you fail, they say, you idiot. Of course that wasn't going to work. But when you succeed, they're like, whoa, where'd that come from? I never expected that. And now all of a sudden you have this whole open opportunity. So 
I always said to people at Qualcomm, you know, question unconventional wisdom, or com question conventional wisdom, because there's always assumptions in it that are wrong, and when you figure out what those are, that's where the real opportunity um, exists. That it was share success. Sh share success, because yeah, I mean, we believe in yeah. crossing the finish line together as opposed to yeah. I think it drawing came, elbows. Irwin set a, co a company culture that was very good, and he had set it even in the previous company where everybody believed in giving back, that we're very fortunate that we, um, you know, we got to a certain point. I, I got, get up at the all hands, I mean, I say to people, we built or we participate in the building of, of humanity's largest technology platform in, the, in wireless. Um, it's created great opportunities for us, but it also created great responsibility, too. You should use that platform to improve people's lives around the world, and people love that. They want to be part of something bigger than themselves, and so that is a hugely motivational thing. When you're sitting there grinding away on the 14th bug of the day that you have to fix in the third code line of this particular, you know, blah, 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 you know, which isn't so much fun, you can think, well, yeah, but this is going to go help somebody's life be better somewhere else in the world. And when you think about it that way, that's a, you know, that's a very unifying vision. And people come together around that, that kind of thing. So sharing the success that way. And also, as I said, I mean, we're friends. It's, we've created, I think, an atmosphere, a very positive and supportive atmosphere inside the company. Now, I, I will say that as you get bigger, it's hard to keep that. And I mentioned that when some of the processes get in place, people can stop thinking of themselves as a person or the people they're in a, you know, interacting with as a person, they think of them as just another component of a machine, and that's terrible. I mean, you get to that point that's, yeah, not and, and, a good And thing. driving change is about achieving yeah. results, and we know you do that. Yeah. Okay, my last point one question, and this ties to the gift um, that we're giving you, um, which is an Anderson jock vest. So I know Paul's family a little bit, a little, a little bit, and they're Unbelievable jocks, and I mean like Iron Man jocks, poor boys. Not me, but my little brother. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and poor Iron Man. Yeah. And um, you actually bought into a sports team, yep. into the Sacramento Kings. Yep. Here we expect this on your next run. All right. We hope. That's good. I got uh, a um, bike ride on Friday. So. Uh, yeah, well, that's daunting with his brothers. No, I'm not doing it with my brothers. Uh, <laughs> and. and um, is that a part of the community giving piece, or is it that you love the, sports, the Sacramento Kings? No. Well, I mean, there was definitely a civic element to it, for sure. But it wasn't like I had such a tie to Sacramento, Sacramento personally. It was great to be part of that and see how the community came out. And when, I, when we talked to the fan base in Sacramento, it, you know, of course, it's a bunch of guys who could write a check for a basketball team. But the team didn't stay in Sacramento because there were a bunch of guys who could write a check stayed in Sacramento because the league saw that the fan base was incredibly passionate there and they didn't think that was a good message to send to pull a team out of a city where people were so passionate. So, um, so it was a great thing to be involved with but the thing that's cool for me is we're actually using this to motivate new technology. We're building a new arena. It's going to have you know at least megabits per second for everybody in, in the arena. We're doing stuff with uh, virtual reality so You'll be able to sit in a box or up in the high heights of the, the arena and feel like you're sitting at courtside because you, you can look in augmented reality. And by the way, this technology works, and you guys will be watching sports this way in the next few years. That you'll have virtual reality headsets on, and you'll feel like you're courtside at a game. Or you'll feel like you're actually even the player, from the player's point of view, running through the line in a football game. Oh, my God, that is a big guy that's trying to kill me right there. <laughs> that's well. how it'll be. So that's Thanks. getting, you know, really interesting synergies. So you can see why Paul's the 2014 uh, Wooden Global Leadership Award recipient. Thank you for inspiring. Thank you for being such a terrific leader. Thank you for coming to UCLA. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.